Hi folks and welcome to the second episode of my series on learning Rust. And today we'll be f carrying on with the kind of second half of the first chapter of the tutorial that I'm following, which is learning Rust with entirely too many linked lists. I have my coffee and I am ready to go. So let's take a look at where we were last time. So let me zoom this in a little bit. There we go, that's better for video. So this is the code as it was at the end of the first episode that I recorded. We've got some basic list data structures and then we've got an implementation of a couple of functions. We have a new function to create the list. We have a push function to add new elements to the head of the list. We've got a peak function to take a look at what is currently at the head of the list. And so there's a couple of more things we're going to add to this today. Let me grab hold of the tutorial. So we're going to add a pop function. We're also going to add a drop function which will be used to clean up the list when we're finished with it. And we're going to add some tests. So tests are always pretty important. So yeah, that should then make sure that we've got all the code we have is implemented correctly. So yeah, pretty much ready to go with this. So let's dive straight in with implementing a pop function for our list. This function is going to do kind of the same as the peak function, it's going to return what's at the head of the list if there is something there, so if the list isn't empty it will return a value, but it's also going to remove that item from the head of the list and update the list so that whatever the next item is, is going to be the new head. So this is a going to need a mutable reference to our list and it's going to return an option wrapped around an i32, the same as I believe our peak function did. So, yeah, let's go ahead and add this to our code. So we've got a peak function here. I'm going to copy this, and we're going to add, change this to be our pop function. And our pop function is saying needs a mutable reference to the list. So I think I'm going to start with a copy of the contents of the peak function and then update it in line with what's in the tutorial. So what have we got? Yes, yeah, so this is briefly introducing option which we actually used in the first episode of this series, but that was because I wrote the peak function myself rather than following the tutorial. So an option can be either sum or it can be none, and it is a generic over a type t. So we can have an optional any kind of type we want. Here because each element of the list is just an i32, we're going to have an optional i32 return. The starting point for this function in the tutorial is to lay out the match, which can either match an empty list or a list with some content in it. We don't need to do that at this stage because we've copied the implementation of the peak function. And if we try this without any code in these arms of the match statement, it's just going to hit a compile error because there's nothing returned from the function. So jumping past the bit of this page in the tutorial that's discussing the unimplemented macro, what we've got here is the first attempt at some logic for the pop function. So we have a result being stored and then returned at the end of the function rather than just returning the expressions in the arms of the match, and that's so that we can have this additional statement to update self.head after we've got the current element. So let's modify our 
code to look more like this. So we're going to need a new local variable called result and rather than just evaluating our match statement to be these expressions we're actually going to set the result here. So let's do that and then return result at the end of the function. And we don't need a semicolon at the end because the final expression without a semicolon is what is returned by the function. And so now we can add the line to update self.head is, I think it's node.next, though I may be wrong here. Let's take a look. Yeah, node.next, that's what it's saying here. So we have this matches what's here, and it looks like we will get a compile error. We do see the analyzer showing an error here saying that we can't move out of node.next, which is behind a shared reference. So what it's trying to tell us is we've already got a shared reference to node, so we can't go and grab a non-shared reference to something that's within node. So let's let's see what that looks like output from the as output from the compiler. Still got our dead code warning. Yeah. <laughs> Helps if we actually save the modifications that we've made. Cool, this is what I wanted to see. So yeah, the borrow checker isn't happy with how our code is currently laid out. We're trying to take a exclusive reference to the link object that is in node.next when we've already got a shared reference to the entire node itself. So that violates Rust's idea that we can only have one thing owning a particular object at a time. So we're going to need to do some sort of magic to make the borrow checker happy here. Let's see what the tutorial tells us about this. Head desk. <laughs> I don't think it's that bad. Um, that is understandable. So, yeah, this is the best approach, really. Take a step back, think about what we're actually trying to achieve. We're trying to check if the list is empty. If the list is empty, we just return none. We're happy, nothing more to do. If the list isn't empty, we remove the head of the list, we replace the head of the list with the second item in the list, so that's going to be the next element within the first head element that we've got, and then we return the value. So yeah, we want to remove things, and we want to get the head of the list by value. So we can't do that with a shared reference because we need to be able to grab the value exclusively. And here we're talking about doing replacement. So the way this is going to be implemented is using the mem replace function that we saw in the last video to swap two elements around in an atomic way so that the borrow checker is happy that there's no intermediate state where there are two supposedly exclusive references to the same object. And we're actually putting this in the match statement here. So we're replacing we're grabbing the header list and temporarily making the list empty so that the list object actually no longer has a reference to the head element of the list. And then we've got an exclusive reference to the header list that can be then a mutable reference because 
it's the only reference to this element because the list no longer has the reference, the list is now temporarily empty. And then we update the head of the list to the next element of the node. Cool, so that looks okay. All we need to do is modify this match line to use the replace function. So where we've got a match here, we're gonna have mem replace and we're gonna replace the I think it's and mute self.head with link empty something like that. Yeah. So we get the current head of the list and we replace it with empty. And then we switch on what the value of the header list was before we temporarily made it empty. Cool, that looks okay. We're not seeing any analyzer errors. Let's see what happens when we build this. Cool, we have a build and now we actually have no warnings. The previous warnings we were getting, let me scroll up a bit on here. We used to see these dead code warnings on every build because nothing actually used this next element within a link. But now because we are using node.next in our pop function, we no longer have any dead code warnings. So this is looking pretty good. And then to finish this up, what we want to do is just clean up the code a little bit. We can swap these statements round. So let's let's go ahead and do that. It will clean up the code and we'll do it in two steps. We will grab this line and move it in front. So this expression doesn't actually depend on the value of self.head so we can reorder them happily. Um, again this still builds fine. Now what we've got is this result variable is actually redundant. We can get rid of it. So we're going to get rid of this, we're going to get rid of this, and we're just going to change these to evaluate to some simple stuff. So yeah, now this match statement evaluates to either none or the contents of what was previously the head of the list. We don't need a temporary result local variable to store this and to return it. So this is looking pretty clean. The code in the tutorial just goes one step further and says we no longer need curly brackets in the first branch of this list. So if I join these lines, get rid of the curly brackets, we then have something simpler. This is not happy. Ah, so we need a comma. Well, we don't have the... Did we previously have a comma? No, so we didn't previously have a comma. But when we remove these curl brackets, we need a comma to separate these expressions. And this just makes the code a little more compact. So it says temporarily replace the head of the list with an empty list for now. And then depending what previously was the head of the list, if it was empty, then return nothing. There was no elements in the list. If there was some content in the list, then what we want to do is we want to update the head of the list with whatever came after the first element in the list. So we've popped that first element off the list and then we want to return the contents of that first element. Cool, that looks pretty good as our pop function. And let's just do a final build to check everything's happy. And that looks good. 
So after doing the implementation of our pop function, the tutorial we're following moves on to talk about adding some tests to this library. And that's always really good. It's great to actually see some tests in a tutorial. Many programming language tutorials don't really cover how to do testing, but it's good to see this here. But I'm actually going to skip this for now. I'm going to save this for the third episode of this video series. And in that third episode, I'm going to cover testing and also automating the testing using GitLab CI. What we are going to do now is implement the drop function for our list object. And this drop function is the destructor that Rust is going to call automatically whenever an object of this type goes out of scope. And its job is to go through and clean up anything that needs cleaning up. And Rust will then free up any memory after the drop function is finished. Now Rust will actually implement this function for us automatically. We don't need to write out an implementation for the drop function if we just want the simplest possible implementation where Rust will go through and free all the memory associated with our object and recursively call the drop function for any object that we reference. So the insight the tutorial has is that the automatic implementation of drop is not really going to be very good. So what we hope is that this is tail recursive. So the last thing that needs to be done to drop a list is to drop the first node. The last thing that needs to be done to drop the first node is to drop the second node and so on. And so rather than actually creating new stack frames for each of these operations um, and treating this as function calls, it can just transpose it into a while loop automatically. But what the tutorial is telling us here is that this is incorrect, that the compiler can't actually do this. So let's go through this code and try to understand it. So we've got a couple of different types. We've got list type, we've got link type, and we've got this box node, and we've got a node itself. So let's go through and look what each of these automatic drop functions would look like. So for the list, we just drop the head of the list. There's nothing else really in a list. So if we look at the list type, it's just got a head. So if we're going to drop this list, all we need to do is drop whatever element is referenced by head of the list. And that's fine. That there is the last statement of the function. So rather than doing a function call here to itself, we can just turn this into a while loop. This can become tail recursive. And I will I'm I'm not going to cover tail recursion in detail here. That's something you can go and look up if you're not familiar with it. But let's look at the drop for uh, link itself. So the link is an enum type. So there's two options that we can have here, but there's actually only one value stored in any particular link. So when dropping a link, we need to look what, which of the two options does this take. If it's empty, there's nothing to drop. If there's something in the link, then we go ahead and drop it. And again, this can be optimized into a tail recursive implementation. It can be transposed into a while loop. So again, this is fine. Then what happens when we have this boxed node here? When we want to drop a boxed node, we have this recursive core here, but then we need to deallocate the actual memory before we return from this function. Since this call to drop isn't the last thing in the function, it's not going to be tail recursive. We can't just replace this with a while loop because we need to actually finish dropping this box node before we can free the memory. And what's interesting here is if we look at the node itself, 
that's going to have the reference to the next element in the list. So we need to keep hold of element A until we finish dropping element B. We need to keep hold of element B until we finish dropping element C. So we can't do this in a tail recursive fashion in the way that the compiler is implementing this by default. And so it will end up with a stack frame for each element of the list and that's not really ideal. So the tutorials telling us to manually write our own loop here. So we're going to implement drop for a list in a way that uses a loop that doesn't require holding off on the deallocation step until we've finished dropping all the later elements in the list. And we're doing this using the memreplace function that we've seen before. This makes sense. It seems that this replace function is actually really useful when implementing lists. It's come up all the time. So what this is going to allow us to do is grab the head of the list and replace the head element within the list with this empty value so that there is no longer the list is no longer holding a reference to whatever element was at the head of the list. And then we're going to have this while loop here. And it's using the while let syntax within Rust. And what this means is we try to assign, we try to perform this assignment statement. And this assignment statement is going to succeed if current link, which is a link object, so current link is a link, it can either be empty or it can be a reference to some additional boxed node. So it's going to try and perform this assignment. And if current link is empty, this assignment will fail and the loop will finish. If current link is a reference to a boxed node, then the assignment is going to succeed. So we keep running this code in this loop until we get to the point where whatever element we're currently looking at is empty and there's no further elements in the list. So this loop is going to go through and run for A, then for B, then for C without needing any sort of recursion. And for each element that we find, we're going to use the memreplace function to take the next element in the list, grab our reference to that, update our current link to point to the next element in the list, and replace that element with empty. And that's going to cause this reference to go out of scope. We start off with the list itself having a reference to the head, and we're going to get rid of that. We're going to get rid of the reference in the list itself. So now we've just got current link is the only reference left to this node. And then when we update current link to point to the second element in the list, we now have no references left to that first element in the list. It's going to go out of scope and the memory can be deallocated while we continue on with the second element in the list. From the second element in the list, we do this replace again so that we no longer have the second element no longer references the third element and we've got the only reference to the third element here and again when this gets updated that reference goes out of scope and the memory gets dropped. So a little difficult to explain clearly here but hopefully it does make some kind of sense and this is no longer recursive is the main thing. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and add this code. So we've got our general implementation of our list object. But what we're now doing is we're adding an implementation of a particular trait. And a trait is kind of an interface. It defines some common functions that could be implemented by multiple types. So multiple different types can have drop functions and the drop trait tells us how those functions should look, what the signature should be for that drop function. So we're going to add a new implementation block 
for the drop tape for our list. And we're going to have a public function drop. And let's see what signature should be. Okay, so interesting. We don't have pub fn in here. And if that's what the tutorial is saying, that we don't need pub in this line, then we're going to get rid of it. Let's stick to what the tutorial says. And we're going to have a mutable reference to self in the argument. Of course, it's mutable because dropping the list is obviously going to mutate it. It's not going to be left when we finish. So let's look at this first line. We're creating a current link local variable and initializing that with this replace function. So we're going to say let mute because this is a mutable local variable. We're going to call this replace function. And we're going to have the same as above the head of the list replaced with an empty link. Yeah, that matches what's in here. And I think this is the first time we do using a mutable local variable. So in Rust we need to say when we declare a variable whether we want to be able to mutate that or not. Um, just the way that Rust forces us to be explicit about lots of things. And then we're going to have this while loop. So we've got while let current link equals, and then what are we doing? Ah, no, I'm a little bit wrong with how we're doing this. We're actually not. We're actually creating this boxed node variable here. So let's do that. So this is some interesting syntax here. It allows us to define a new var local variable box node within this let expression. Very similar to how you can do this in Python when unpacking tuples. And within our loop we just need to update the current link to point to the next element using mem replace again. So it's going to be some sort of mutable reference I'm sure. Um, and it's probably going to be box node dot next and we're going to replace that with empty. See if that's right. Cool. Yeah we got it right. So this function is going to look at each link object in the list and it's going to look at whether it is empty or whether it is a reference to another node. And as long as it keeps being a reference to another node, we're going to keep running this loop and this loop is going to grab hold of the following element and it's going to drop the current element. And hopefully that makes some kind of sense. Let's save this and check that it builds. Yep, that builds. So we have a drop implementation for our list. So the final thing that I want to do with this code for today is to commit these changes to our git repository so that we don't lose them. So let's just do a git diff so we can check what we've added. Yep, this looks exactly how I expected. So we've added the pop function and we've added the drop function for our list. So we're going to git add those changes and we're going to commit this with a commit message saying added pop and drop function. And we're going to push these changes up to the repository on GitLab. So I just wanted to illustrate how this drop function works using a bit of a diagram here. So what we've got is the same as in the tutorial. We have a list 
with elements A, B and C, which is what we've got here. And I've called this first one self because that is actually the argument to this drop function. And then we've got a local variable current link, which is going to be a reference to one of these nodes at any time. So we start our function off with the list as it is, and we're going to set current link to what was self.head, and we're going to replace self.head with an empty link. So that's essentially grabbing hold of this reference here and moving it over to current link. So self no longer has a reference to this node. It's head element is actually empty and current link is a reference to this node A. And then we come and look at this while loop here and we're going to look is there a element referenced by current link? Currently there is. And then this code runs which updates current link to be the next element and at the same time replaces that next pointer within the current element with an empty link. So what this does is it updates this pointer here to point to our second element. So current link is equal to this next reference and then it replaces this next reference with an empty reference. So this link here gets dropped. So now this element has no more references to it. It's gone out of scope and so that memory can be dropped. And then we see the same thing happening. Again we come back to the top of this loop. We say we've got another reference here to a box node. We're going to update our current link to point to it and we're going to drop this reference here using the replace function. Again this is now out of scope so this can be freed. So then we get to this last element we see that the current link does have a reference to a box node so we're going to update that with whatever the next element is. Now this last node the next element is empty so this link gets replaced with empty. Current link is now empty. We've now got no more references to this element, so this element goes out of scope and can be freed. And then when the function returns, current link disappears because it's a local variable and self disappears because you know this is the this is the drop function, this is the destructor for the list object. So when the destructor is finished, the object goes out of scope and can be freed. So that's just a kind of illustration of how that loop works, hopefully to make it make a bit more sense for you. So that's it for this episode of my series on my process of learning Rust. I implemented a pop function for this simple stack that we've got, and then we implemented a drop function, and I give you a bit of an explanation of how that drop function worked using a little diagram. Hopefully that made some sense in the end. So next video I'm going to do will be focusing on the testing of this library that we've got and it will also show how to automate that testing using GitLab CI. So thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video please give it a like. Um, if you've got any comments or feedback please add them as well. It's be great to hear what things people like about these videos, what they don't, what things they want to see in future videos. And I also recommend subscribing to the channel so that you get notified when the next video goes live. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.